Und herzlich willkommen in uh, das DFF, das British Film Institute und Film Museum. Um, my name is Ellen Harrington. I am director here, and it is my privilege and honor to welcome our special guest for the night, Mr. John Glenn. We're okay? Yeah. Um, it's interesting um, to hear that piece of music because there was a great dispute on the film about, not about who wrote it, because Monty Norman actually wrote that particular part. But So John Barry, who did most of the music, hated using it in the movie. And uh, of course, every time Bond went into action, you'd hear, ba 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 da 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 It became a standard. And John, when he wrote the music for the film, he would ignore that and just sort of throw something through of his. And uh, but then, then I, Lewis Gilbert, I remember he said to me, he says, John, he hasn't used, he hasn't used the, the Bond theme on Bond going into action. And I said, don't worry about it, Lewis. I said, I'll fix it in the cutting room. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's exactly what I did. And uh, John Barry didn't talk to me for about two years. But, <laughs> Uh, but uh, there was always a, a great dispute about that, and uh, he really, John hated giving any time on the finished score, and uh, he would stand over me when I uh, when we finished the film, and he'd have to point out what was his music and what was Monty Norman's, and we'd measure it, and they would get paid accordingly. So you can understand why he was a bit upset. He was losing a few quid, you know. <laughs> Well, you can see I have the easiest job of the night because John is such an excellent storyteller. There's almost nothing that I have to do. But I want first to really thank the James Bond Club and particularly Andreas Pott, who organized um, the group that came here tonight and Lady Bond. Um, it's really our privilege to have you in the house. And I also really want to thank the Freunde des DFF and Margot Muller specifically. Um, and also to let you guys know that tonight is really special because after we have the conversation, the film print you're going to see is from our own archive in 35 millimeter and it's spectacular. So uh, something to look forward to after the conversation. So, um, we were talking in my office very briefly about getting your start and you've had such a fascinating career and it may have developed very differently if you were a young filmmaker today. Um, would you tell us a little bit about what it was like to start um, in the studio as a messenger boy essentially and to learn all of these crafts, all of these, you know, what we now call below the line crafts from the masters of English cinema in these decades that you were, a, you know, a young professional. How much time have you got? <laughs> <laughs> As I say, I was 14 years of, a, of age and I just left school. Um, and uh, I always remember I got on my bicycle and I cycled to Nettlefold Studios where I'd heard there was a vacancy for a page boy. And I uh, went to see the commissioner there, and he said, um, sorry, son, he said, you're too tall. He's for the uniform. So he said, but I'll, I'll ring Shepard and Studios. It's a much bigger studio, and they probably might have, you know, a job for you. So I continued, cycled over from Nettlevold Studios at uh, Wharton-on-Thames to Shepard and Studios, where Sir Alexander Corder was making his films. And I got as far as the gate, and the gateman took. I didn't have. We didn't have a telephone. Quite honestly, he <laughs> didn't have telephones in those days. So, or a bit of a luxury. Uh, and I left my name and address. And shortly afterwards, about two or three weeks later, I got an interview as a messenger boy, which I got the job. So I joined about twenty other messenger boys, um, going around the studio with works orders to the various departments. And uh, the chap who was showing me the ropes, he said, don't bother with that. that they never look at them, put them down the drain. You know, so I was being taught by this chap who knew a few things. And he taught me to be very selective on where I put these works orders. <laughs> I didn't take too much notice of him, fortunately. Um, but all the messenger boys all went on be to become stills photographers, editors, 
I don't think any of them ever achieved director, mind you. I think I was the only one who did. But um, they all went on to be cameramen and all various jobs in the business and were very good. But having started work at 14, if you can call it work, um, it gave you an opportunity to look around the studio and see which craft suited your ability in a way. So, you know, in the course of going around with your works orders to various departments, I discovered the cutting rooms, the editing suite. And what attracted me was the smell of, of amylacetate, which smells like pear drops. You know what, do you have pear drops here in Germany? I'm not sure you do. It's anyway, it's a, it's a suite which has a very distinctive smell. And uh, I used to love the smell of pear drops. And I thought, the cutting rooms is for me, <laughs> the editing suite. So I got a junior job numbering the film and doing all the mundane uh, j jobs you do as a junior in the editing rooms, which included getting rid of um, surplus nitrate film, which was extremely uh, flammable. And I remember that uh, a, f a friend of mine, John Lee and myself, nearly set fire to the Shepparton Studios, bur burning nitrate film out on the lot. It was a windy day and we started the fire, a grass fire, and we were really panicked. We were trying to beat this thing out with sacks and eventually we did manage to contain the fire. But uh, it shows you how dangerous working in the cutting room was because the film was so, so um, flammable. And um, on the third man, where I had a junior, I was a junior assistant on the third man, and Oswald Hatton Richter, the editor, he draped his celluloid of his film, The Third Man, over the, the sound head of the movie Ola, which gets very hot. It's got an exciter lamp inside. And he went off and had lunch, uh, dinner in the evening. And, of course, while he was away, the, the film got very hot and eventually exploded and set the set the cutting rooms on fire. Um, apparently, I heard later that Oswald, who, who was a, a refugee from Austria somewhere, and um, he had this, um, this old coat, which was a, we always used to joke about, this that terrible old coat, which he'd got in grass or somewhere. And uh, he beat, went past the fireman and forced his way into the cutting room and didn't come out with the film. He came out with this old coat which was smouldering, <laughs> which was so dear to him. So then we had to then, uh, we had to reprint like three quarters of the film and uh, he employed every editor in the business to, to make the original dates for the third man. Fortunately, the, the negative was at the laboratory miles away. And, uh, and I earned a comparative fortune because I was the numbering boy. I had to number all these reprints and I was, never mind about child working hours, I, I was there practically half the night on overtime working for, um, you know, to, to print all these, uh, number all these rushes. So we used to number the films in synchronization for the editors. And uh, anyway, uh, Carol Reed came in with a crate of beer one night. He was a very nice man and, uh, it, you know, I learned a lot about uh, about what can happen in the cutting room and to be careful about <laughs> nitrate film because it was dangerous. And you had some role in the sound of this picture also in a very crucial scene. Yeah, I'm, I found that... Um, uh, I was of a similar stature to Joseph Cotton, who was in the film, and we, we didn't have a electronic means to get an echo effect from the sewer, sewer scenes. And because I was a similar build, and I was young, I suppose, um, I'd run the film in the theatre, and there was a stairwell outside that had an echo acoustic, and uh, I would then, from memory, then do the footsteps for, for Joseph Cotton. And... Uh, Every time I see the third man, which isn't very often, I think about that and think about, you know, how uh, interesting it was and how things have changed and improved in a sense. Um, but um, no, it was it was a fantastic film. And uh, later on, when I did one of my films in Vienna, uh, I did toy with the idea of canting the camera at an angle. Uh, and then the other way, which um, Carol Reed had done, 
But then I realised he did it for a very good reason, because of the trilby hats the actors were wearing. So it fitted the composition of the frame if you angled the, the camera. Whereas, um, you know, w with me, I didn't have those trilby hats, so I didn't bother <laughs> in the end. So as your editing career developed, there was an opportunity to start being in the company of the people who were making the Bond films. And how did you end up with your first um, assignment in the editing team on um, the Bond series? Well, Pete, Peter Hunt was the editor on the early Bond films and he was very talented and he devised a sort of a, a, a new way of editing. I mean, he absolutely revo revolutionised uh, the editing process in a sense. You know, uh, Sean Connery would look towards the door, next minute he's in the corridor walking down. I mean, English films at that stage, they would follow the person all the way to the door, bore the, bore the audience, you know, and then walk them down the corridor. He, he and Terence uh, Young devised this system. It was like a short shortcut, you know. Uh, it was a style, uh, abbreviated style of editing. And um, I admired it very much, what I saw, because it was really strange. And the Peter, Peter, of course, he edited all those early Bond films, which were a huge success. Um, he, he was a, a friend of mine, and he said to me, he said, when uh, Dr. No opened, uh, it, there was a press show, and uh, he said, Terence Young came, as directors do, they stand at the back of the auditorium and they try and gauge whether the film's working or not or whether all those decisions they made are okay. And he said, and the, the, the press all started laughing at the film and Terence Young had made a straight thriller. And when they started laughing, he got terribly embarrassed and he walked out the theatre and he walked home and he went home. And uh, Peter said when uh, the, the reviews came out that, that evening, from the, all the evening papers, uh, he rang Terence Young and he said, Terence, you better go out and get the papers because they're raving about this new style of, of filming, the James Bond films, you know, the, the humour and the, you know, it was just a fantastic revolution in filmmaking for, in, in England. And... Terence said, oh, that's all very well, he said, but how am I going to do the second one, <laughs> now knowing what I know? <laughs> so you can say that, in a way, that the whole Bond thing started almost as an accident, you know, because Terence made a very serious thriller for a million dollars, went 10% ten, ten, uh, ten over schedule, uh, over budget, so he was a bit of a bad boy. And when you compare it today, what do they cost today? Two hundred and fifty, three hundred million dollars. So, from the time of editing or being, you know, in in the um, the team, you got to know the Broccoli's and Michael Wilson, which became a long time family fam friendship in a way and a long relationship. Um, so, um, how? How do you look back on that time, um, you know, as this group, creative group was developing? You were working with Ken Adam, um, many other legendary people in these, you know, creative um, roles in production design, in, um, you know, uh, the cameramen. So, um, yeah. yeah, how do, you know, um, what's, you, what's your, as you look back on, on that time in that creative family of people who came back, you know, film after film, what is the strongest, you know, yeah, well, memory you have about that? I suppose I was very fortunate because Peter Hunt, who uh, I've talked about, um, he he eventually got the break to to uh, direct on the Majesty's Secret Service, and it was a huge break for him. And uh, he set up a second unit to do all that snow stuff, and they had the worst <laughs> winter. There was no snow, uh, and uh, the unit went, you know, went crazy up there in the mountains and. You know, and then it started to snow, and then of course it it became like imperative to do the snow scenes quickly. And uh, the Bob Run was the big action sequence of the film. And I got a call from Peter Hunt. Quite surprisingly, I was working on the doing a fill-in job on the Italian job, and the phone rang in the theatre at Twickenham, and uh, they said, "Oh, Pyman are on the phone. Uh, can you ring Peter Hunt?" So I went out and called called Peter and. Uh, he said, get your ass to back to, down to Shepparton and uh, as fast as you can. And when I got down there, he opened up the script and he said, read that scene, which was the Bob Run sequence. And he said, uh, how would you like to direct it? 
and I couldn't really believe what was happening. And the following Monday, I was on a plane flying first class to Switzerland to a whole new career, if you like. Peter had been watching my career the same way as I'd been watching his career. Whereas mine was mainly on television, uh, film television series like The Prisoner and Danger Man and all that stuff. Um, and uh, that's where I really got my experience of second unit directing. And uh, then, of course, I made a big success of doing my bit on A Majesty's Secret Service. I took over the entire action stuff on the film and, uh, and finished up editing the picture as well uh, with Peter, because Peter was a very good editor as well. So and that was a good, very good relationship. But then, of course, Peter didn't get asked to because he went over budget. And he had grand illusions. Of he wanted to do Major Barber or something, you know, so quite different to a Bond movie. Uh, so he, we kind of fell out of sync for a while. And then I worked in uh, Paris with Louis Gilbert. I did a couple of films there. And uh, one day the uh, phone rang, Cubby Brock is coming into town. And uh, he came in and he offered Louis uh, Spy Who Loved Me to direct. And uh, when he came back from lunch with Cubby, uh, Lewis said, oh, he's, uh, Cubby sent his regards and he wants you to do some action stuff on the movie. And uh, the consequence of that was that they sent me out to Baffin Island to do the famous spy, uh, ski parachute jump. And I didn't realise it at the time, but uh, that was the first shot on Cubby's standalone picture. Harry Saltzman had sold out to MGM. And uh, when when they, that, I managed to come back with that shot, which cost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in that day and age, um, Cubby must have secretly said, "This guy, I'm going to watch this guy because he he's produced the goods," you know. And uh, then they sent me out to San Moritz to shoot the, the scene that preceded it with Willie Bogner. And um, I didn't realise it then, but uh, Cubby had already earmarked me f for something in the future. I didn't know what. So then we did um, Moonraker, and uh, then uh, Lewis said to me, he said, I think this series has run its course, don't you? And I said, I hope not. And then he said, uh, then I got a phone call to come to have lunch with Cubby Broccoli. And I went there, and there were all the key technicians that were on the film, and uh, not much. He would, Cubby wouldn't commit himself. He was going to be the new director, and uh, the special effects guy... He said, what about me, you know, and everyone laughed nervously around the table. Anyway, a week later, I get another phone call, and when I go there, I'm, it's just me and Cubby and uh, Michael Wilson and Dana, his wife, around the table, and I began to suspect something was about to happen. <laughs> and he said to me, would you come back to the office? And when I washed my hands, I went back into the, into the office, and they were sitting, as Cubby was sitting at his desk, and they were sitting around, and they were all staring at me. I walked in, and they said, Cubby said, how would you like to direct the next James Bond film? Well, you can imagine how I was affected by that, because it came completely out of the blue. It was the last thing I ever expected. So it's like, I suppose it's the equivalent of winning, uh, winning the lottery or something, I don't know, because I've never been that interested in the money side of it. I've never ever sort of said, you know, how much am I going to make out of this? And it's never occurred to me at all. And uh, I'm, a, I'm on a recce for, for your eyes only, and Michael Wilson and I are hopping from island to island. And uh, we, we gathered on the rear of this ferry between Greek islands. And he said, I suppose we ought to talk about money. So I said, look, Michael, I said, I'm going to do this film, whatever you pay me. If you don't pay me anything, I'm doing this film. <laughs> So I, I put myself in a bit of a disadvantage, money-wise. <laughs> um, but I probably would have made more money, because it's like a two-year assignment, basically, uh, to direct a Bond movie. And uh, I think I got paid $250,000. I'd probably made as much editing as I did then. But, of course, it didn't occur to me then. It, it, that was the least. I knew, I knew that if I made a, had the opportunity uh, and made a success of what I did, the money would take care of itself. You, you don't have to worry about it. Because once you become a successful director, uh, they throw money at you. I mean, it's unbelievable. <laughs> they do. They absolutely throw money at you. It's amazing. It's like all your, 
you know, I don't know, dreams come true. But uh, as I say, I never bothered about it. Yeah. Well, and that started 10 years, a big commitment of five films over 10 years. Um, and you still hold the record for the director who has made the most Bond films, which is worthy of applause. Absolutely. <laughs> Now, before we get into talking about the, the films a little bit um, more specifically, I want to go back to what you were saying about the action shots and the second director, you know, second unit um, shooting that you did. Because this is the era of practical effects. This is not CGI. So um, would you tell us a little bit about just you know, how you had to use the training you had from television, a lot of different, you know, practical, long-term um, motion picture tricks in a way to get some of the shots that you got. Yeah. Well, first of all, you, you have to realize that on a bomb picture, you get the cream of the crop in terms of help. You know, you get the best cameraman, you get the best this and the best that. So, you know, you have a great team behind you. Uh, they still need directing. They need still, you still have to prepare the film. And the preparation of a movie is the most important part of it. And when I'd finished preparing the movie and we went on the floor, I used to say to myself, the film's made. I've made the film. I've made all those decisions. And from then on, it's a question of just getting through the day and keeping the schedule. Um, and looking at, you know, you get all kinds of problems come up with the actors and what have you. Although I was very lucky, I had Roger Moore. Now, Roger was great. Um, he Initially, he was a bit wary of me, I think, because I'd done lots of films as editor with him, and I think he was not too sure whether I'd make it to become director. I mean, it's quite a big difference, I suppose. But uh, in the end, he came round, and uh, he was wonderful, and uh, his sense of humour was fantastic. Every day you go on the set, it was like, can't wait to get to work, you know, <laughs> get a few Rogers gags, and, you know, we allow about half an hour a day for Rogers jokes. And uh, But he was wonderful, and uh, it was a great help to me. Uh, initially, um, you know, the times were tough in a way because... We went to Greece and we were on the beach and uh, all, the he all the heads of United Artists were sitting there under their parasols with their looking, at, looking at each other as I went further, got further and further behind schedule because I was having problems with these beach buggies that would, kept packing up a bit like uh, the car, the DB5, we came here tonight and you know, it was, everyone was conking out with the sea spray and what have you. So I was having to pan the camera, to, instead of the, moving the cars, I was having to pan the camera past the cars to give an impression of moving, you know. And that was tough. And they kept sat looking at Cubby and said to him, you know, if he's going to be three days behind after a week, how long is he going to be behind after six months, you know? And uh, Cubby reassured them I would be okay. But he did come up and gave me a bit of a talking to and said, you better pull your finger out and get back on schedule. Well, I was doing my best, wasn't I? But So anyway, the following week, we worked hard and we got back on schedule. And uh, from then on, it was great. And Cubby came up after three weeks. He came over, he said, I'm going back to Los Angeles. He said, call me if you need me, which is <laughs> a wonderful thing to say. It, just gave, it, it gave me the confidence. He was behind me and he was always there if I needed him. But... It worked fine. We came back. In, we came in on schedule. I think it was twenty-seven million dollars the first film, right on budget and on schedule. And then they asked me to do the next one, <laughs> and so it went on. <laughs> so this meticulous planning obviously is, you know, ninety percent of what you um, had to do in order to make sure that things went well, except for, you know, onset disasters or or, or accidents, um, but also all of the locations, the kind of um, global perspective of taking Bond around the world. And you've said in the past this was actually one of the key features is really, um, you know, delivering on um, different locations, an exotic story, all these things. So how did you, as you went through these five films, think about, you know, where would they take place and how did you plan for all those international shoots with so many things that could go wrong? Yeah. Let's say we have this wonderful backup production crew, you know, that, um, that you know, you go out to these, Michael and I would go out and we went to Corfu and we thought everything in Corfu we could do, you know, for a film. We were still writing the script, I might tell you, at that time. 
So it was giving us ideas all the time. And uh, uh, I was trying to work out a car chase and uh, we, we saw the olive pickers, you know, they used nets strung between trees and they shake the trees down and the, the olives fall into the nets. And I took that in and I thought, mm, I'll use that in the in the thing. So but we worked that in the script because when you do action scenes, if you can get people involved, it gives you a perspective. You can see the size of everything because it relates to a person. And it's a very basic thing about filmmaking. Um, a lot of fantastic stunts have been done, but they failed because... They could be little toys, you know, you don't get any relation to size. So it's essential that you relate to uh, a person. So I always, in my action scenes, I always involve people. Uh, a little bit dangerous at times, but you have to be very careful. Uh, being an editor, of course, gave me an advantage in a sense, because when I storyboarded these action sequences, um, each one was a cut. So I'd have hundreds of drawings all around the room and the, uh, the producer would come in, uh, the associate producer, and he'd say, I can't believe this, it would take us months to shoot this, you know, so I said, they're not all separate shots. I said, that's one shot, to, you know, that encompasses, say, six or seven different storyboards. And he couldn't understand that, but um, that's the way it works. But, you know, you have to, when you're dealing with a big action sequence, you have to photograph, sometimes we photograph the storyboard and we shoot half the sequence and where we haven't, we, instead of putting missing scene in, you've, we've used to photograph the storyboard <laughs> that went between the bits, you know, to join them up. So as you build the scene up. Um, so it's a, a great, great thing uh, to be able to do because when the sun shines and the conditions are perfect, you can do your wide shots. And then when it's raining, you can do your close shots and your inserts. So you keep everyone working, which is important. You can't ever, once they start playing football, you're in trouble. <laughs> no doubt about it. So we are all very lucky that Lewis Gilbert was wrong, that the series wasn't played out and that yeah. it's been going on. But then yeah. that obviously leads to the fact that there have been several different actors. And there's, you know, as... Um, the decades progress, there will probably be more. Um, you had already a very good relationship with Roger Moore as an editor. Um, you made these three first Bond films with him, and then there was a shift. If you talk about a little bit about um, the transition to Timothy Dalton and how were you involved in selecting him? Well, I was the one who suggested Timothy because he had been in the office some years before where he had made a huge hit with a with a movie. I'm trying to remember what it was. It was a period piece, but um, very early in his career, and he got terrific notices, and he is a terrific actor. And um, we were desperately... We'd lost Pierce Brosnan. Lion in Winter. Lion in Winter? We'd lost Pierce Brosnan because Mary Tyler Moore had him under contract. Um, and when she heard he was going to play James Bond, she invoked his contract. So that put him out of the running. And, uh, we, you know, we were all set to go. I tested him and everything, and we were all set. We'd done costumes for him. Can't believe it. And so we, now we're in a bit of a... a, a, a sh we, we, we've got to shoot. We've done the location records, everything. We've got to shoot at a certain date. And we haven't got a James Bond. So... We were all scratching our heads together, and I said, what about Timothy Dalton? And he said, well, he, he turned it down a few years ago. I said, yeah, but I don't think life's been exactly... They've not been knocking the door down to sign him up for any films lately. I'm sure he'd be... He'd listen to an offer now. So uh, we had a meeting with him at Michael Wilson's house in Hampstead, and he said, you know, he was very interested, and... Uh, he said that um, if he could make it a harder edge type of bond, he'd be you know he'd be very interested in doing it. So we hadn't written the we we had written the script to a degree, but we then fine tuned it to accommodate Timothy to his acting because he he's a fan, well he's a Shakespearean actor, but I don't think you have to be a Shakespearean actor to play James Bond quite honestly, as George Lazenby uh, <laughs> demonstrated, but. Um, I think that, uh, that you know, he is a very good actor, but you need to use his talents as an actor. So we, we did refine quite a bit of the script and uh, try to keep the humour. And we got a very good support actor in Jerome Crabbe. 
and the usual cast, you know, with uh, Desmond Llewellyn in play Q, which is always fun. I mean, we, we, uh, Roger used to, when, when <laughs> with Roger, he used to rub his hands with glee when, when Desmond <laughs> Llewellyn used to come in for a few days because he only used to work for about a week. Uh, Desmond Llewellyn and uh, Roger would just take the mick out of uh, out of Desmond because Desmond was so straight, you know. He was like, you know, he was. He'd say, "Look, at me, I'm supposed to be a, a, a chap that does all this tricky stuff with his hands." He said, "He said I'm a gardener." He said, "Look at my hands." He said, "He had these big fingers." <laughs> and uh, was a lovely, lovely man. I mean, he was a very good friend of uh, Janine's and ours, and we went all over the world with Desmond. But um, great fun, and I used to get uh, I used to get Desmond off the hook sometimes by um, he'd he'd rewrite the script for Desmond just just before lunch, and we were shooting on him after lunch, and he'd write in all these very long words that you can't pronounce, you know, and uh, I, I I felt it was a bit cruel actually, so uh, I used to devise a way that uh, I'd bring someone in with a a, a pad. And all the dialogue was written on it. And like, would you sign this, uh, you know? And then he would speak all this line that was on the pad, and he could read it for Desmond's sake. I did that. Uh, so I used to get back to Roger that way. But uh, we had such fun on those films. Believe me, it was. We worked hard, but uh, it was not hard work if you're enjoying it, is it? So um, there's a few other crucial casting decisions you always have to make in each of these films. Um, one is your villains, and one is your Bond girls. So what was your philosophy behind um, the different actors that you would seek out for the, for the villains? Let's talk about villains first. Well, yeah, the villains, I mean, we've had some fantastic villains, haven't we? Bert Frobe and, and um, what was his name the, 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 in Spy Who Loved Me? Fantastic uh, German actor. Kurt. Kurt. Kurt, Kurt, Jürgens. Kurt, Jürgens. Kurt, Jürgens. Kurt yes. Jürgens, yeah. Whose collection we have here He's at the fan. museum, actually. He's a fantastic um, plug for us. He was so smooth, you know. It was, <laughs> and um, yeah, and he 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 was great. And of course, it's a very important important role, the villain in a bomb movie. It's got to be something special. I was very disappointed when I when they used um, the actor. What was his name? Christopher Waltz. Yeah, Christopher Waltz. Uh, was used in that film, and quite honestly, it didn't seem to appear until the end of the movie when it was almost too late, you know. But uh, he did appear in that early scene, but it was photographed so darkly you could, uh, couldn't really recognize him, you know. I felt, and I thought, if you have an actor like Christopher Waltz, you've got to use him, haven't you? Uh, so it, his part was so underwritten, I thought that was a big mistake. Um, he should have appeared earlier in the movie. Because he was, he, he was cr on the crest of the wave. Did someone tell me he's, do, he's doing a he's back in this film, mm -hmm. Christopher Waltz? I believe he's back in the new Bond, which is you know it's a shame they didn't do it the first one. <laughs> but there you go. And um, what about the Bond girls? And obviously working with two different actors and two different sensibilities. Roger Moore is a little lighter and more comedic. You were trying for a, you know, a harder edge, as you say, with Timothy Dalton. So how do you cast f for that? Well, casting the, the, the lead Bond lady in the film, I'm not using the word Bond girl, <laughs> although I think everyone else will. Um, apparently it's taboo to say these days, Bond oh, girl. I just but, did it, uh, sorry. Yeah. But um, no, I think that it's, it, you go. You have a sort of a short list of the top actresses you want, and most of them turn it down because the history of Bond leading ladies isn't good. Quite honestly, if you were looking back through the history, not many of them have gone on to do anything else after a Bond film. It's a strange phenomenon, but it's true. Um, you choose a Bond woman mainly because you're looking for someone who can act a bit. Uh, but looks fantastic and photographs well. And that's very important in a Bond movie. Um, so, you know, that was, it was a difficult combination to get a, a good actress who looks great, photographs well, and wants to do it, quite honestly. <laughs> so it does take a long time. In fact, it's the hardest decision on the movie who's going to do it. And we go through all the agents in Hollywood, and eventually they they put f people f forward for it. 
but usually it's it, they're not always the best actresses sometimes and uh, you have a few problems I mean Lewis not Lewis um, Roger Roger Moore who's like line perfect every time you put the camera on him he's like straight off take one take one all the time he's just absolutely you know got a photographic memory he had and um, so what I would have to do is to shoot Roger's stuff first so that he he could then because the girl would t he, t he would take one take and they would take about eight takes you know to get a, a, a performance and I had to break it up in bits and pieces so I had to do it that way otherwise poor old Roger would get so brassed off and browned <laughs> off that he would um, he would get fed up. So we we had a, a good arrangement in that sense. But um, no, we had some we had some very good actresses. Maud Adams was terrific, terrific woman. She she was so good. We used her twice. We got stuck. We we, we couldn't find a Bond girl, uh, a Bond lady, I should say. Um, we couldn't find one. And uh, Cubby turned around. He said, I, he said, what's Rob? Uh, What's um, uh, what's her name doing? Uh, what was Maud. What's Maud doing? Find out where she, what she's up to. So she actually appeared in two Bonds, Bond films. In fact, she did make a brief appearance in the third one, but I just kept her in. She came to see us in San Francisco to go, and I got her to walk right through the background. Uh, yeah, she was lovely, Maud. Yeah, we had, we had some good good t good ladies. Yeah. And the last kind of signature component I'm going to ask you about is the music and the decision about who, you know, it's always a contemporary, you know, musician of that era, um, but having to come up with a theme song that usually includes the name of the movie. Um, and then it's presented in this very specific stylized way with this history of um, the title sequences. So how did you make the decisions about which you know, singers or, you know, groups you were going to deal with. You had, the, you know, the music of the 80s, obviously, as the context. Well, the thing is that uh, I think Barbara Broccoli was young enough to be, uh, you know, on the right wavelength about the current state of the pop world, if you like, you know. Uh, I remember she came up with Ha Ha, that group, and... Uh, she dragged us all the way down to Croydon Empire or something to listen to a concert that they were giving. And, I mean, the, all these young girls were in there screaming their heads off, you know, with it before they'd open their mouths. And you could hardly hear them sing. <laughs> it was such a raucous occasion. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, it's not my sort of music. And uh, they, <laughs> they have, uh, I'm a bit too old fashioned. I'm a bit Shirley ba Bashish. <laughs> uh, you know, I like the old ballads and that, and Tom Jones and stuff like that. So I'm a bit out of date, really, a bit old fashioned, I suppose. So uh, we left it more or less to Barbara and Cubby to see who would want to do a, a song to start with. And it's quite a complex. It's quite a complex business because you've got to. When most of these artists are signed up with a. An agent who signed up with a um, with a radio uh, corporation of America or somebody, you know, some big thing, and you have to negotiate the rights, and it gets so complicated, and you can spend weeks and weeks trying to find the right person that fits into the all the problems you're going to get. So um, I'm afraid I hadn't got the time or the patience to <laughs> go through that, so I tended to sidestep that one, and we had a couple of disasters uh, where the the song came in as we were in the dubbing theatre, and you know, the, and the song always came in very late. The only exception was Sheena Easton, and that we did. Um, it was the first time we ever actually showed the artist singing on screen during the titles, which was really nice. Um, but um, yeah, they come in very late, and uh, if you didn't like the song, it was usually sh uh, recorded in, Amer in America, and. Uh, if you didn't like it, you either had to throw it out and find someone else, call Shirley Bassey. That's what it was. <laughs> that was the cry that used to go up quick, get Shirley Bassey. <laughs> so, yeah. But, you know, sometimes I wonder whether, we're, I'm trying to think of the actor, the artist who, who, who we threw out, but I won't embarrass, you, embarrass him by mentioning his name, but... Uh, the, the sound department at Pinewood, uh, you know, you'd get the, this eight-track score coming from America, and they would run it, and 
it, it's almost as though they made it, try and made it sound as bad as they could so that they would prove that they were experts at refining it, you know. But uh, after two runnings, <laughs> Cubby said, get rid of it. We're Shirley Bassey. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you had to be ruthless sometimes. But uh, generally, I mean, Marvin Hamlish was fantastic. He, he came over and... Uh, we, he wanted to play the um, the theme tune for Spy Who Loved Me. Nobody does it better. And uh, we went over to this theatre too at Pinewood, which had a, a rather out of tune piano. And Marvin Hamlish Hamlet, Hamlet sat down at the piano and he thumped out uh, Nobody Does It Better and sang it. And he had the most awful, awful voice. <laughs> But it, even with that, it was. I just wish we'd recorded it at that time because it was such a memorable moment. It was such one of the best Bond scores of all, wasn't it? Um, um, nobody does it better. It's fantastic. Um, and Marvin, of course, he died a few years ago, but uh, he was a very, very funny man, very talented. Yeah, loved working with him. Fantastic. So we have time for a few questions from the audience. Raise your hand and Urj Spori will bring a microphone okay. oh, down here. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what is the funniest joke in your James Bond films? <laughs> <laughs> well, we used to make a... We used to make a... a a film, of, uh, yeah, we used to make a film of the bloopers, all the mistakes that were made during the film. And um, w there was a scene where um, Kurt Jurgens uh, fires a missile under the, this huge Ken Adam table into Roger Moore's crutch. And uh, the special effects guy was a bit um, trigger happy and Roger was a bit slow jumping out the chair, where the, which finished up with, with Roger running around with his arse on fire. <laughs> and uh, afterwards, uh, Roger said, he said, uh, he said, I had have Vaseline dressings on for two weeks. And he said, I had two holes where most people had one. <laughs> and one of Roger's uh, jokes, he always made the best out of it. but. Uh, I'm sure it was very painful. <laughs> okay. Yes, up here, please. So my question is, why did uh, Dalton not get his uh, third film? Why did Dalton not get the third, a third Bond yeah. film? Well, he was signed for his third film, um, but there was a delay for some reason. I'm trying to think what it was. He was signed up anyway, so that he, he did financially. He did quite well. He got he got paid paid off. But uh, the Americans, <clears throat> he didn't do, he wasn't as popular in America, apparently, as he was in Europe and the rest of the world. And the management at MGM was changing all the time, and they were in financial troubles. And one way or another, the time it got delayed and what have you, they, they felt, they made the decision, drop Timothy Dalton, drop John Glenn, drop uh, Richard Maybon, drop... Uh, Michael Wilson, you know, the whole thing was a, thrown up in the air. And they, I think they probably made the right decision, you know, they, they started again, started fresh. Um, I think I was pretty much drained of any ideas after five, quite honestly. Um, you know, there's a limit to, to how inventive you can be, I think. As you, uh, you know, I was at my prime, I suppose, of and my imagination was fantastic in those days and I could come up with these things, but... Uh, yeah, it was good. Someone else, and Cubby rang me, and he said to me what they'd said and what have you. And I said, oh, I think it's a good idea, Cubby. You know, give a, a fresh guy a go and see what he can do. He said, Well, I don't agree with you, but uh, you know. Uh, so we've always remained great friends. You know, it's, it's, it's a sort of a divorce, I suppose. You know, <laughs> after eight movies together, um, it is a bit of a wrench. And I certainly missed it terribly, but I wasn't going to let them know that. <laughs> Yes, I, w I was just wondering, um, I think License to Kill is a great movie, but uh, uh, you often say, also in your biography, that you think it is your best movie that you made. Uh, what are your um, argumentation for that? Well, I think it's technically, I suppose, it's, I mean, the, the, the truck sequence is probably the, you know, it was 
such an extensive sequence, such an important part of the film. It's probably half an hour long, you know, and uh, very dangerous working with all those those very big trucks. Uh, Remy Julian's crowd did did me proud, really. Uh, the chap with the, uh, the the Frenchman that was rehearsed doing a wheelie with a 10 wheel or 20 wheel truck or whatever it was with a prime mover. I mean, you see wheelies done with an ordinary car, but you get one of those big trucks and, uh, you know, to do a wheelie with that is a, is a fantastic bit of driving, whichever way you look at it. And uh, the guy that we, that Remy Julian had trained to do this was supposed to arrive on the appointed day and, uh, uh, we were almost giving him up for lost, and uh, he apparently had met a girl on the plane and had gone off, uh, as Frenchmen do, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, uh, but he did turn up that morning, the same morning we were doing the shot. Take one, did it perfectly, and then left. Went, presumably went back with the girl again. I don't know. <laughs> But it was an amazing bit of, uh, not only did he do his wheelie, but he, he rubbed, he landed the vehicle on top of the, the bed, his <coughs> Jeep, and smashed that and flattened that on the ground. It was a fantastic stunt. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, how much input did you have in uh, the amount of violence that is, especially in License to Kill? I mean, uh, especially the... Um, sequence in which the i think milton crest was his name explodes in the pressure chamber like how many dis discussions did you have about how violent can this get well we kept cutting it down i mean we, we it was a very clever bit of special effects work we we did a, a image of um, milton crest crest's uh, head which was pneumatic and we blew it up with a an air machine right so you know, as the as the pressure went up in the in the, the whatever it is the pressure chamber, the head expands and eventually blows up and splatters blood all over the thing. It was it was pretty horrific, I must say, and uh, the sensor took exception to it as well, even though I'd cut it down, and uh, we did we we really reduced it almost to oblivion in the end, and we had to do the same with the with the. Da uh, Robert Darby, when he, he gets a total burn at the end of the film, um, when Darby burns. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it. It's a kind of a, the drug scene. It's a kind of a very violent subject, and maybe we were wrong to to do it at that time, but it was a, a thing everyone was talking about, and we researched it very closely. And uh, these these uh, drug lords were really vicious guys they, they used to go after people's families and that so we felt we couldn't really we had to tell the story as it was not not to make it a fairy story you know so that's that's why we put this sort of bits of violence in i suppose but uh, it might have hurt us at the box office a bit i think in retrospect but it looks good now because you can get away with more now can't you yeah we have five more questions we will have them all and then uh, we have to finish but it's the next question um, your signature is the use of doves in the films. Where does pigeons. <laughs> uh, pigeons, yes. Where does this come from? They're cheap and they're plentiful, <laughs> and, and you you can get them anywhere in the world. <laughs> that is basically the truth, because you know you get a crate of pigeons and you you put one stuff one in a hole in a rock somewhere, and then Roger Moore's come and puts his hand in the, to get a handhold, and the pigeon runs it comes out, and Roger Moore almost falls down in the. Uh, the depths, you know, and uh, as I say, it's, it's basically it became my trademark, but it was basically because they were readily available anywhere in the Jeep. That was that's the truth. <laughs> uh, I have to say, uh, I love Lice to Kill, it's amazing. Uh, what would you say to the future filmmakers about action, how, how they should kind of Look at it nowadays, and, and what what are your tips for action directors nowadays? It's a difficult question, really, because with CGI, that you can do anything with CGI. It just costs money and takes time. Um, it's taken a lot of the enjoyment out of it for the director, because a lot of the, the finesse is out of his hands because it goes to some 
goes to India or wherever they do it, you know. And uh, it's um, it's really not quite. I mean, we used to like to see our stuff the next morning and um, do it for real. And I'm not sure that CGI. I mean, they use it on a lot of things now. And my son's a CGI editor and a visual effects editor. And he says on Harry Potter they were putting 150 elements, extra elements into each shot, you know, owls flying this way and that way. and You can do anything with it, but it's taken a lot of the skill out of the actual shooting crew, you know, how, how you devise how to do the scene. I mean, you know, there's tricks that the Keystone Cops used to do, you know. I always remember the... The truck, uh, the, the car with four guys in it crossing the railway line in front of the locomotive. And uh, people used to wonder how that was done. And apparently they used to, they used to tow, the locomotive used to tow the car through a series of pulleys so that it was timed so it was that close um, on uh, colliding with the, with the train. And those sort of things that, you know, you, you do like the foreground miniatures we used to use uh, on Octopussy, the foreground miniatures of going into the hangar. Uh, they're, they're, they're so easy to do. Uh, as long as the first unit's not doing it, it's just definitely a second unit job because they might spend two weeks setting up and getting it absolutely right. But uh, you couldn't afford to do it with the first unit, not with 150 people, you know. But a smaller unit can do it. And uh, yeah, I think that... That's quite a, if you look at Octopussy and you look at that t uh, pre title sequence, which has nothing to do with the film whatsoever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's about an eight or nine minute sequence. It's like a, a second feature used to be, you know, on a movie. And uh, I came up with it. I, you know, we were desperate to try and find a, um, a, a pre title sequence. And Cubby sit, looked at me and he said, You better think of something to do. And, I sort of toyed around with an idea, and we were still writing the script, so I had no idea really exactly how, what way the script would work. So I just wrote this as a bit of a, you know, just played around with it. And uh, and in the end, that was the best they could find, so they we shot it that way. It was quite a good sequence. But I, I would rather it have been something to do with the movie. <laughs> But the BD jet, we, one of the main reasons we did that was because Peter Lamont said to me, he said, I've got three BD jets in the hangar, which we made for Moonraker and didn't ever use. So he said, they're there, you know, ready to use. So that got me thinking. That's how we, we eventually, you know, economic, economics come into it a great deal, how much it costs, things cost. Mm. Good. Um. The score of uh, License to Kill from, from Michael Kamen has uh, like um, I Heart and Lethal Weapon touch. Was it your idea or the producer's or Michael Kamen's direction? I think Michael Kamen actually. I wasn't that impressed with Michael Kamen uh, initially because I, I, he lived in uh, Nottingham Hill in London and uh, I went down to see him and talk about the score he was doing, etc. And when I arrived there, he got this, the, all these kids in the house, you know, his own children and other p children. And he kept going off to do something for the children. And I, I felt I wasn't getting the right amount of attention, quite honestly. But um, on retrospect, he had, it was a very good st score. It was traditional, a traditional Bond score, I would say. But it's not bad. It's quite good. Um, I think you could say the same thing about my, uh, Arnold, David Arnold scores. They're, they're a little bit John Barryish, aren't they? In uh, a lot of ways, um, but th it is a style of music you get on the Bond movies. Uh, very dramatic, and uh, yeah, I, I thought he did a pretty good job actually. Well, I would be interested in the thing or something you remember from all five movies that you enjoyed the most of making the films. Ah, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I have to say that uh, I did enjoy every movie very much, and uh, uh, I couldn't wait to get to work every day. It was, it was, just, it was such the crew and everything, particularly the ones with Roger Moore. Um, I think probably the scenes we used to do with Desmond Llewellyn, who played Q, 
that was something we all used to look forward to with with Desmond would come on the set. He was he was such a straight man. He was like, you know, he wasn't uh, at all technical, and uh, you know he. he he, he couldn't uh, remember his lines. He was getting quite old. He was getting as bad as me. And, uh, he, he, you know, we'd have to put idiot boards up and uh, stamp lines on the other actor's forehead, you know. Um, on one occasion, we were doing a scene with Timothy Dalton. Was, I think it must have been Living Daylights. And um, we had the scene where uh, we had to put gas masks on while Q demonstrated uh, this nerve gas, right? So <laughs> Desmond puts his gas mask on and uh, Timothy does and then they do the experiment. And then Timothy takes his gas mask off and I said, no, no, Desmond, keep yours on because we can put the lines over, you see, because they just move, just move your mouth and we can put any lines over. <laughs> So that's what we did. That's how we got through the scene. Uh, that was quite amusing. Timothy didn't think it was amusing. He couldn't believe he'd never seen anything like it working with an actor. He was mumbling and moving this without replying. <laughs> but uh, I think he got used to us after a while. <laughs> yes, our last question. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, thanks for taking my question. I have a question about License to Kill, uh, specifically Benicio del Toro. Uh, we all know what he wanted to become in the film industry. Can you talk about what the thought process was, although it was a supporting role, the thought process between uh, securing him for that film? Thank you. Um, who did you say? Benicio. Oh, Benicio Del Toro. Yeah, he was, um, he was, it was, it was an idea of Barbara. She, she knew him from Hollywood. Uh, he played, had a small part in a film and she was very impressed with him and she recommended him. And I wanted a younger person to play the sort of second villain. And um, he, he was a bit off the wall, but he said, he was a very sort of way out type of actor, you know, and, uh, but very effective, you know, he was a sort of a modern actor, you know, he, he was a bit methody, I suppose. But uh, unfortunately, um, we had an accident. We were doing the scene where um, uh, the, the, the machine that used to cut up the, the dope or whatever it was was running. And uh, Tim, Tim Dalton is having a fight with Benicio on the, on the thing. And during the fight, um, Tim got his hand badly cut by Benicio, who wasn't very disciplined, you know, I mean, and also we were using a real knife because it has to glint and what have you, you, you know, you can't use a rubber knife very well. And um, unfortunately, uh, Tim got cut quite badly and taken to the dressing room while the ambulance was coming. The assistant said to me, he said, uh, uh, he said, what are we going to do about, uh, carry on? So I said, Yo, get, get go to Tim and get him to give us his ring and the stuff that was on his cut hand, you know, his watch and all that stuff, and I'll uh, use a double and carry on shooting because you have to carry on. So he, he looked at me for a second and he said, no, you're going to have to do it. <laughs> he wouldn't want to face Tim with that, so I had to go into Tim's dressing room. And uh, I said to Tim, can I have all your jewellery and stuff? And Tim looked at me and he gave me a wry smile. <laughs> he thought <laughs> no one would want to ask him to do that. So I got all this stuff and put it on the double when we carried on shooting. And Tim went off to hospital and got stitched up. And, and then he came back very shortly afterwards and uh, he was fine. But he was, he was quite brave, I must admit. But uh, Benicia was a bit of a bit of a wild card really but he's good you know he's unusual and uh, well he went on to get an Oscar for best supporting act on a couple of films later so it was quite a good choice on Barbara's part mm. fantastic thank you all for the questions and thank you John Glenn for coming to see us here in Frankfurt and spending the evening with us so give him a round of applause Right. 
And as we have heard so much about his works, we have a uh, special trailer with four minutes of your works put together by a member of the James Bond Club, uh, Deutschland. It's a great thing to have it here. We will show it before the film starts, License to Kill, 30 years after. And we have a 35 millimeter original print from our own archive. It's really magnificent to watch it, not digitally, in the analog way, in the way John Glenn shot it. So enjoy this evening. See you. <laughs> 